But Father, thank you for sending us your Son. I pray today that everyone in this room, every one of us will have ears to hear what you have to say to us today. May our ears be open and may our hearts be open as we come around your word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, If you'd like to meet me in John chapter 20, we're going to anchor everything uh, in John chapter 20 this morning, but uh, I'm reminded of the words that if we have a look at all of the religions of the world, If we have a look at any other religion on the planet apart from Christianity, every religion paints a picture of man striving after God. In Christianity, and only in Christianity, do we have the message of a God striving after the hearts of people. And God did that largely through the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth. Let me read to you a passage from John chapter 20, starting in verse 24. It says, now Thomas, most of us will know about Thomas. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. What has happened here is that Jesus has been raised from the dead and uh, the the disciples come to Thomas now and they're going to say, we've seen the Lord because Jesus appeared to the disciples, but Thomas was not there. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, I think there's people in this room today that might even repeat these words after me. And they might say, you know what, this is where I'm at. And that's okay this morning. We have seen the Lord, said the disciples, but he, Thomas, said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I think there's people in the room that could possibly be where Thomas is at. If you're patient with me for a moment, let's not forget that Thomas was not an unbeliever. Thomas was a disciple. Thomas spent just over three years with Jesus, as did the other disciples. We don't know a whole lot about Thomas, but here's what we do know. We do know that in John chapter 11, when Jesus says, I'm going back to Jerusalem, all of the disciples say, you've gone crazy. Why would you go back there? Everybody hates you and everybody wants to kill you. Why would you go back to Jerusalem? Thomas says, we must go with him, even if it means we die with him. That's the same Thomas that we're reading about right now. Here's what I love about Jesus, and here's what my prayer is today, is that Jesus will do to you as he did to Thomas. Because what Jesus did to Thomas is he met Thomas right where he was at. We're going to see that Jesus didn't scold Thomas. Jesus didn't rebuke Thomas. But he did encourage him to believe. If you're sitting here this morning and you say, you know what, I've I've heard a lot about Jesus, but I have some niggling doubts. I hope that we can cover some of the evidence for the, for the, the validity of the person of Jesus of Nazareth that will push you across that line. Because Thomas, like so many believers, Thomas is standing at a line. It's kind of like you're sitting in an aeroplane without a parachute. And Jesus is saying, jump out, I've got you. How many people are ready to jump, right? Thomas knows if the disciples, if what the disciples are telling me is true, Thomas knows, and I want to press this point this morning, that he's about to cross a line that he can't go back across. If you're telling me that Jesus has risen from the dead, then everything he said is true, everything he claimed is the truth, and his demand for all of my life and all of my trust is what I must give to him. And I believe that many of us will find ourselves at that point in our Christian journey. I have been at a very, uh, kind of, as Richard spoke about over communion, I've been at the place in my own life where believe was a word I used very flippantly. I've been at a place in my life when it was more important for me to go to work on Sunday than it was to worship God or to go to church. I've been at a place in my life when it was better to go fishing on a Sunday. Interestingly enough, by the way, if you go fishing on a Sunday, the fish don't bite. 
And whenever I worked on a Sunday, I never had a good day at work. I never really achieved anything. But what I found was this. Believe was a very empty word for me at that time. And through the course of time, I began to preach on the Gospel of John, which is where we are today. And I found every, just about every chapter and every paragraph I read, he had the word believe, 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 believe. In fact, he uses it 99 times in his gospel. And every time he does, it's a verb. And it means to cast the fullness of your reliance and trust upon Christ. It's not repeat these three sentences after me and now you've got a free ticket to heaven. That's not what John was talking about. It's not what we see in the book of Acts. It's the whole of our lives abandoned to living for Christ. Conversion is a radical transformation in every part of your life, as progressive as that may be, or it's not conversion. And Thomas knew, if what you're saying is true, I've got a problem. Let's keep reading for a moment. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. It's about to get real. If someone walks through the wall, it's about to get real. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve is the encouragement from Jesus this morning, but believe. If you've been a Christian for 20 years or if you have never heard the name of Jesus before, today I pray that you will be led to the same place that Thomas found himself at the end of this paragraph. Let us begin. Why should we believe in Jesus? Interestingly enough, if I go down the street now, you could probably put this to the test. If I asked 100 people, do you believe in God? The interesting response would be, I reckon at least 80 would say, I believe in a God or yeah, I kind of believe in God. If I was to press those people further and bring up the name of Jesus, the conversation would change dramatically and almost instantly. And there's a reason for that. Because people believe in a God that is distant. People People believe in a God that possibly, yeah, uh, kind of created everything, but doesn't really have any interaction in our lives. And, And while he's in a galaxy far, far away with little Yoda, I'm happy with that kind of a God. But when you mention the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter how far away you've placed that God, immediately he comes to bear on your life. Immediately there's implications because Jesus is God from far away right here. Aristotle, very smart man, said that God and man can't be friends because there's far too much incompatibility. C.S. Lewis sums up friendship like this, when two people standing next to each other turn to each other and say, you too. And in the moment when Jesus is hanging on the cross, suffering in all of our sin, shame and nakedness, can we not look at him as well and say, you too. But can we believe in Jesus? Is there evidence that Jesus is who he said he is? Some people would say today that Jesus was nothing more than a myth. He's not even a historical figure. But let's work our way through. I'd like to present some evidence before you this morning, but I want to start with what I call minimal facts. Minimal facts are facts that even sceptics and now staunch atheists attest to. Richard Dawkins, who is not a scholar in history or any matter concerning archaeology, Richard Dawkins, one of the most antagonistic atheists of recent times, for a very long time said Jesus never actually even lived until a historian challenged him on it and he backed down and said, no, the evidence is conclusive. Jesus of Nazareth is a real person who lived in real time. Uh, Minimal fact number one, Jesus of Nazareth is a real person. He was born maybe 2 to 3 BC, but no no later than that. Jesus of Nazareth, we will see, uh, minimal fact number two, was crucified under Pontius Pilate. In fact, Bart Ehrman, who is a scholar of New Testament, but an atheist, there's an oxymoron for you, a New Testament scholar, but he's an atheist, he says that the conclusive evidence for the crucifixion of Jesus under Pontius Pilate is so resounding, you can't deny that he lived. Minimal fact number two, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
over 90% of skeptics and staunch atheists agree with these facts. Fact number three, and we will go into this more uh, towards the end. Fact number three is his tomb was found empty. Over 90% of skeptics confirm the fact that the tomb of Jesus is still empty. They have some, we're going to get to them in a moment, they have some really far out ideas about how that happened. For the teachers in the room, you ever heard about, ever had a kid say the dog ate my homework? It's about on par with some of them. We'll get to those in a moment. Fact number four, his disciples believe he, he appeared to them. Uh, I believe it was Chuck Colson that said, it was the Watergate affair that convinced me that Christianity must be true. And he said, because we had 12 of the most renowned international leaders at the time that could not keep a lie for three weeks. And yet you're telling me that's, that 12 frightened, scared men kept a lie unto their horrible deaths for some decades. Other minimal facts are that John the Baptist baptised Jesus in the Jordan River. Undisputed, the historical evidence that Jesus was baptised by John the Baptist in the Jordan, resounding. That James, the half-brother of Jesus, more about this in a moment, but also a sceptic, becomes a believer, and also the Bishop of Jerusalem, more about that in a moment, and the Christian church was established and grew rapidly. Those are minimal facts that nobody from any kind of scholarly background refutes. What do we do with this man, Jesus? He's no longer a myth. And I pray today that you cannot leave him on the shelf as a man. C.S. Lewis can be quoted as saying that he looked at the evidence for Jesus of Nazareth and he says, uh, when I look at the account of the Gospels, we'll get to those in a moment, when I look at all the evidence surrounding Jesus of Nazareth, he says it is clear that Jesus said what the Bible says he said. It's clear that he did what the Bible tells us he did. So we are left with three options. Either Jesus was a liar, Jesus was a lunatic, or he is Lord. C.S. Lewis would say, Jesus is Lord. So we've started with minimal facts. We've started with a foundation. Let's get rid of the, the nonsense and the rubbish for a moment, that, that Jesus never even lived, that we made him up, that, that these guys just made it up. Let's get rid of that rubbish for a moment. Jesus lived. He died a criminal's death, crucifixion, under Pontius Pilate. The tomb is empty. They all believed that he appeared to them. Let's move on to the Gospels. Everything I'm going to outlay today, you can go and research this. We, we could go down rabbit holes, honestly. We could go down rabbit holes of evidence for weeks concerning the person of Jesus Christ. I just want to skim the surface to give you an idea. But when it comes to the Gospels, many people say, well, you know, when you speak about evidence for Jesus, you're only using the Bible as your source. Well, no, I don't. Uh, if you want to have a look at the minimal facts, for example, you will find that Josephus, who was a Pharisee, not a very good one, by the way, because when they ran into the temple and killed all the other Pharisees, he went and hid. But uh, apart from that, Josephus, the Jewish historian who didn't like Jesus, speaks of this uh, Christos, this Jesus who at his hands magical happenings happen. He speaks about the crucifixion of Jesus. He speaks about how much the Pharisees hated Jesus. Uh, almost a hundred years later, we have a Roman historian by the name of Tacitus. Now, this is remarkable because Roman historians never recorded anything that didn't exemplify Rome and, and the power and, and the might of Rome. But yet Tacitus not only vehemently records uh, events concerning Jesus and Christianity, which had taken off by that point in time, but also Paul the, Paul the Apostle that we know in the book of Acts became a thorn in the flesh for Rome. So it's not just the Bible, but can we actually rely on what we read in the Gospel accounts? Great question. 
When we look at eyewitness accounts, let's, let's bring it into our sphere today. If, if you're in a court of law and somebody's charged with murder and the, the charges could vary whatever they may be, the first question everybody's going to ask is, how many eyes do I have? How many eyewitnesses do I have? That's what the, that's what the prosecution want to know. That's what the police want to know. That's what everybody wants to know. Where's my eyewitnesses? Uh, if you're in a court of law, you have two types of evidence. Evidence number one is direct evidence. Evidence number two is indirect evidence. We would call indirect evidence circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is only eyewitness testimony. DNA, indirect evidence. Fingerprints, indirect evidence. Direct evidence is eyewitness accounts. If you spend five minutes in Tasmania, you will find sometimes eyewitnesses lie. How can we trust that what these guys are saying is actually something that's credible? Good question. We have four eyewitness accounts, and when we look at the Gospels, it's important to note that they are actually historical biographies. Now, if, I were, if later on, when all of you guys write a biography about my life, uh, there might be many publications about my life, but they will all come from a different perspective. There might be stuff that Terry writes about how awesome I am that other people don't include. I'm looking at you, Baz. Yeah. And that's what we have when we look at the Gospels. What we have to do when we have an eyewitness account is we have to subject them to four questions. And by the way, if an eyewitness in a court of law passes these four tests or these four questions, then the judge will order the jury to hold their testimony as concrete evidence. Question number one or test number one, were the witnesses really there? There is a case recorded, I remember a gentleman saying that they had uh, a crime had been committed and they had a suspect, they brought him in, but it's what the, the, the way the investigators did the uh, uh, interrogation was terrible. They gave this guy half the information. This guy confesses, I did this, I did this. He gives details of the crime. They put him up on the stand. It takes two minutes for the other guy to prove the guy wasn't even there. Confessed to the murder, knew details about it because the cops gave it to him, but at the end of the day, he wasn't there. Go home, son, case closed. None of your testimony is valid because you weren't there and what you say you saw could not have possibly been. When we look at the Gospels, were these guys there? Apart from Luke, yes. And Luke uses these guys for his account. Were the witnesses really there? Question number two, or test number two, can they be verified or corroborated? When we look at the Gospel accounts, by the way, this book here, we're going to learn more about this next week, but this book here is the most pulled apart, scrutinised and analysed book on the globe. If there is one book they would like to discredit, it's this one and they still can't do it. It's still the globe's number one bestseller for a good reason. But these four accounts... Can they be verified or corroborated? Not only can they be corroborated by other eyewitness testimony that we read, but they are verified by historical archaeological facts. The names, the places, the dates. Have a listen to this paragraph I'm going to read to you now. If you're going to make up a story, if you're going to make up some kind of mythological thing, you're not going to give pinpoint concrete evidence that people can test you on. Have a listen to this passage from Luke chapter 3. I wasn't going to read this out, but I'll read it out because it's just amazing. Have a listen to this. Luke, the historian, writes in chapter 3, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Traconicus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. If you're going to make up a story, you're not going to use names, dates and places to, that can, people can come and test you on. Question number three, have they been honest and accurate over time without changing their story? No matter how much pressure was put on these guys, the story never changed. Did they possess a bias that would cause them to lie? They had no reason to. Luke, in particular, has zero reason to lie. He's writing a historical account for the most excellent Theophilus. We can apply the, 
these tests and many more to the gospel accounts and we find that they are historically accurate. Why are people like Bart Ehrman New Testament scholars? Because they are beginning to realise the epistles, the book of Acts and the gospels are enormously valuable and credible when it comes to formulating historical events. Names, places, culture. <clears throat> Were they written early enough in front of others to be accurate? That's a really important question. When we come to things like Gnostic Gospels, why aren't the Gnostic Gospels in the Bible? First and foremost, they present a Jesus that is not real. And second of all, most of them are written centuries later. The Gospel of Mark was written 30 to 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everybody's still alive. Matthew and Luke are written some 50 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and John writes his gospel sometime later at about 70 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Not only are they early accounts, but they can be attested to. In comparison, the earliest time that we see pen to paper concerning the life and conquest of Alexander the Great is almost three centuries after his death. But nobody argues with the validity of the historical events surrounding Alexander the Great, but yet it was almost three centuries until they put pen to paper. It was three decades until they put pen to paper concerning the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The other one concerning uh, the Gospels, and we will probably touch on this when we have a look uh, at the resurrection in a moment, but the other one is what we call embarrassing testimony. If you were going to write a historical biography, if you were John, if you were Peter talking to Mark, because Mark writes his gospel from the lips of Peter, if you were Peter talking to Mark, if you were Matthew the tax collector, you'd probably leave the tax collector part out. It's what we call embarrassing testimony. When a biography or a story has embarrassing testimony, it, it points to the validity of the testimony. And what we find in every gospel account is they speak about Peter's denial, they speak about the bonehead moments that the disciples had, like when they were fighting over who's going to be the greatest, Peter's denial, and the fact that all of them ran away when they were put under pressure. If you were going to make the story up, you'd keep that kind of stuff out. It's like when I tell you guys about my days in football, I only tell you about the good days. It's like fishermen. If a fisherman fishes 100 days, he's only going to tell you about the two days he caught fish. And if you were going to write about a man that was risen from the dead, you would not have used women testimony as the first people that saw the empty tomb. You would not have done that in the first century because it was embarrassing testimony and the weight of a female testimony in the first century had no weight at all. You would have kept that part out. Can we trust the gospel accounts? When we read the gospel accounts and I've only touched the surface, the answer is yes. The next one I'd like to touch on is one that most of us would know. There was a man in the United States that printed out the complete chapter of Isaiah 53. He took it around to his workmates and said, have a read of this and tell me who you think this person is talking about. So this, everybody in the office reads it and everybody says, you know what, there's no doubt in our mind that this is speaking about Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, no worries. Now, can you please tell me when you think this person wrote this? Well, sometime when he lived. No. Isaiah prophesied at about 740 to 700 BC. In fact, the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Messiah, those prophecies are so accurate in the book of Isaiah that everybody up until recent times said, you know what, Isaiah wrote his prophecy. This book was written after Jesus died until a little shepherd boy stumbled upon some Dead Sea Scrolls and they were able to date the prophecies of Isaiah to almost 700 years before Christ. Not only in the book of Isaiah, but the book of Jeremiah, the book of Zechariah and many of the other Old Testament prophets prophesy about Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, many more than these, but absolutely 100% hits the nail on the head, 44 of Old Testament prophecies, Jesus of Nazareth fulfills completely. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, uh, the age uh, that he begins ministry, all these things. How much he was sold for and betrayed for is foretold in Scripture. 
For those that are mathematical in the room, the mathematical probabilities of one man of history fulfilling only 44 prophecies is one in a trillion, 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 trillion. This is why I don't do numbers. It's mathematically impossible that anybody could do that. Why is Jesus of Nazareth the man that I place my faith and trust in? He's not only can we believe the gospel accounts, but there is the miraculous and the supernatural attached. The Jewish messiahs read the same Old Testament. The Jewish, sorry, the Jewish uh, rabbis read the same Old Testament but come to a different conclusion. Jesus has filled 44 of the prophecies but many more as well. As we come towards the end, I now want to come to what I call the linchpin of Christianity. If you're sitting here this morning and you say, I don't want to believe in God, I, I want to challenge you to do something. And you, If anybody can disprove this one, I guarantee you, I will not come next Sunday. I'll go find another job, I guarantee you. Disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All you have to do is go back through the historical accounts and find the body of Jesus Christ for me and I won't be here next Sunday. We're going to get to the chapter that Paul uses in a moment. But Paul says, you know what, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, you're still in your sins and your faith is futile. Anthony Flew was the famed atheist turned believer in God. He says the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other religion. It's outstandingly different in quality and quantity. Philosopher Karl Popper says that the ultimate test if something is scientifically credible is not that it can be conclusively true or proven, but whether something can be disproven. Can you disprove the resurrection from Jesus, of Jesus Christ of Nazareth from the dead? A Bart Ehrman, we're going to begin, I'm going to give you four E's this morning when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but... Uh, Bart Ehrman says that the death of Jesus Christ is resounding evidence of his life. And the first E that I would like to start with is execution. You do not have a risen saviour. You do not have a man risen from the dead unless you have a valid execution. Jesus Christ of Nazareth was absolutely crucified. The Romans didn't get this wrong. If you were one of the executioners and you failed or the person didn't die, then the the fact of the matter was that you would pay with your life. There is zero recorded accounts of any person ever surviving Roman crucifixion. Hands up anybody who's watched The Passion of the Christ. Great movie. If you haven't watched it, I would challenge you to watch it. But everybody says the Passion of the Christ is really, really gory. But you know what? It still doesn't measure up to what actually happened to our risen Lord and Saviour. They flogged Jesus till veins were exposed. You don't, you're lucky to survive the beating and the flogging, let alone crucifixion. Mel Gibson was very, in some ways, respectful. Nobody has ever been recorded surviving Roman crucifixion. Every gospel account records the death of Jesus as well as Josephus, as well as Tacitus, the historian. Jesus dies in either 30 or 33 AD. The second E, really important one, is empty. There's resounding historical evidence that the tomb that they placed Jesus in is empty. Now, there has been some radical rebuttals because what happens is, uh, faced with the implications of this, people run and hide from this one truth. I don't know if anybody's heard of Lawrence Krauss, but Lawrence Krauss is a dirty-minded little git that crawled out from under some kind of a rock. But when he was debating with William Lane Craig about the existence of God, he vehemently and adamantly opposed every single point, but when it got to the resurrection, Krauss says, you know what, I'm not even going to argue with that. Let's move on. Why? Because he didn't have an argument for the fact that the tomb was empty. Here are some of the uh, far out ideas that people have come up with. First one is, Jesus never really died. That he kind of resuscitated himself over three days and moved a two and a half ton stone slightly uphill and managed to slip past a Roman guard outside 
and disappear through a city that was swelling at Passover time and nobody saw him. The second one is that the disciples stole the body. The disciples who had ran away frightened and scared and were hiding for some weeks afterwards, those same disciples snuck past a Roman guard, managed to get the stone up the hill without anybody knowing what's happened, take the body out and we still don't know where the body is. It's kind of like uh, the, the reason is every time somebody makes up an excuse, every time somebody tries to come up with a reason why the tomb is empty, they're actually proving the validity of the Christian claim. It's kind of like when that student walks into the room and says, my dog has eaten my homework. It doesn't matter what excuse he comes up with. That young boy could say aliens came down in the middle of the night, thought it was a great transcript that they would take home for their parents. It doesn't matter what excuse they come up with, they are still pointing to the irrefutable fact, I don't have any homework. And it doesn't matter what excuse people come up with. It doesn't matter what kind of far-fetched idea they try to come up with. They're still alluding to the one uh, irrefutable truth. The tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. And we can't find the body. The third E is early. And what we read in the book of Acts and what we know is that only weeks after Jesus has been crucified and risen from the dead, only weeks after this happens, they are in Jerusalem preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's actually the message, by the way. If you're wondering what was the message, the golden goose message that the disciples had in the first century, uh, the gospel message they had was Jesus risen from the dead. They went about preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter stands up only 40 days after in the middle of Jerusalem and says, this, cru- this Jesus that you crucified has now risen. If that wasn't true, somebody only needed to go to the tomb and get the body out. Number four, as we tie early and the last one in, number four, eyewitnesses together, I want to read to you a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Speaking about early, how do we know that this was something that was very early for them? Have a listen to what Paul says in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Powerful words, by the way, being saved, present participle. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received. And for those that know anything about creeds, and for uh, there are churches that read out creeds, and I don't have a problem with it, I think you should, we should do it, but it says, listen to what Paul says, that Christ died. He's reading from a creed. An early creed, an early set of doctrines and beliefs that the founding fathers had set in place. He says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised. This epistle is written 22 years after Jesus has risen from the dead. By the time we reach the 22-year mark, this is a creed that is in operation amongst the churches, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he has risen from the dead. Let's keep reading on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Verse 5, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, So number four is eyewitnesses. But have a listen to the list of vagabonds that Paul reads off here. Cephas, the one who denied him, right? Then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. 515 is actually the number. And have a listen to what Paul says here. He appeared to 500 brothers at one time, most of them who were still alive. What's Paul saying? If you don't believe me, go and ask them. most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Interesting terminology, verse 7. Then he appeared to James, the half-brother of Jesus, a staunch sceptic, but Jesus appears to him, radically converted and becomes the Bishop of Jerusalem. More about that if you tune in for the Revelation series. Then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Number four, eyewitnesses. And not only eyewitnesses, but enemy 
eyewitnesses. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle is noted in history, one who adamantly opposed Christianity but was radically converted when he says, Jesus appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I have today only briefly, briefly touched on the overwhelming evidence for the historical overwhelming evidence for Jesus of Nazareth. The overwhelming evidence that points to the fact that Jesus is in no way a liar, Jesus is in no way a lunatic, but Jesus is in fact Lord. In fact, if we can finish reading that passage in John chapter 20, uh, as we come to a close this morning, uh, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas crossed the line. Thomas realised in an instant and in a moment, Thomas realised that everything Jesus had said, all the claims about being the Son of God and Him and the Father being one, were true. We need to bear in mind when we think about the resurrection, we need to bear in mind that the resurrection took the disciples by surprise as well. They were surprised. None of them were expecting an empty tomb. Thank you, Stu, if you'd like to come and play gently. Uh, I remember watching a series called AD Kingdom and Power and there's a moment, uh, sometimes you know how you listen to a whole sermon for those that uh, manage to stay awake, thank you, Rob, wherever you are, brother. Uh, his hand up, he's okay. Uh, you know how you can listen to a whole sermon or watch a whole movie but just one part of it strikes you. I remember watching the whole series AD Kingdom and Power and right at the start there's a scene that struck me very, very powerfully and it was a scene where... Uh, the Mary runs to the tomb and the tomb is empty and she runs back and tells Peter and John and the other disciples and says, you know what, the, the tomb's empty. And immediately it paints the picture that we read in the Gospel of John where John and Peter run to the tomb and they go down. Mary's standing outside and, and Peter runs in and he runs out and then John goes in, he has a look around and he slowly walks out of the tomb and, and Mary says, what did you find? And John says, absolutely nothing. He says, but absolutely everything. These 12 frightened, scared men would be horribly martyred for what they believed. They believed they had seen Jesus and they spent their life telling everybody that the God-man had lived on earth, was raised from the dead and he came to rescue us from our sins. This Thomas right here would take the gospel to India for our Indian friends that are here this morning will know this, that Thomas would take the gospel to India and would be horribly, horribly martyred for the testimony of Christ. Peter would be crucified upside down. Paul would end up beheaded. And the apostle John is put in a burning vat of oil and when it has no effect on him, Nero says, get him out of my face. And they put him on Patmos. As we make our way through the Gospels, when we look at the evidence that surrounds us for the person of Jesus Christ, what we find in the Gospels is that there are only ever recorded three responses to the person of Jesus. Somewhere along the line, we think we've got the, we've got the liberty to make up another one, but there was only three responses for Jesus. First one was they were either desperately afraid of him and ran from him. They hated him and they wanted to kill him. Or they were completely besotted by Jesus and cast the fullness of their life over to him. And I want to ask you today as we come to the end, which one best describes you? I'm going to pray in a moment. And if you need prayer this morning, we're always here to pray with you and I would encourage you to come out and we'd love to pray with you. But 
I'm going to ask you to do business with Jesus in your seat. I tell you what we need today. We need men and women of God who will stand and say, I have seen the Lord. We need men and women today that will stand and say, my Lord and my God. And as, we stay, as we're seated here this morning, there's no pressure, but if you want to stand before God physically as a statement both to yourself and to him that says, you know what, I'm going to stand for Jesus in these days, I'd encourage you to do so. Let's finish in prayer. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you meet every single one of us in all of our doubts, in all of our fears, in all of our anxieties. Jesus, you meet us right where we're at. I pray we would take a stand for Jesus of Nazareth. I pray that we would stand upon the validity of the resurrection and for what that means for each and every one of us. Jesus, you are the God-man that came to this earth. You suffered. You suffered in our sin and our shame and our nakedness. You bore all of our punishment and all of our wrath. You took it all away that we could be reunited with God and none of us deserve it. We choose to stand for you. We choose to stand with you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray this morning. Amen.